What you couldn't do, He did. You see, when you come to Christ, all of your assets and all of your liabilities become His. And all of His assets and all of His liabilities become yours. Now here's the difference between us and Him. We have no assets. All we have is liabilities. And He has no liabilities. All He has is assets. He became sin for you. Give me, give me your sin. He said, give me it. Give it to me. I'll bear it on the cross. I will pay the price for it. I will go to hell in your place. And I will give you my righteousness. There's no other way to heaven. There is no other way. It's not my word. That's the word of God. Okay, let's get back to this. Now that you understand what it means to be born again, it means to have that spiritual birth that reconnects you to God. Beginning in verse 6 of chapter 2 of Colossians, it reads like this. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. You know, a lot of us, we abound with complaining. It's like the old uh, Jewish expression, so what have you done for me today? Let me tell you something. If you got, for one moment, what you deserve, it would all be yours. You have nothing to complain about. Because everything that you got from God, you never deserved it when you got it. Right. You never deserve it in the first place. It is nothing but the grace of God. Yes, yes, you. yes. Amen. Say that. Amen. Now let me tell you, there's a difference between mercy and grace. Yes. Mercy keeps you from getting what you deserve. But grace gives you what you didn't deserve. You see the difference? Every promise in the Word of God becomes yours because of grace. What do we have to complain about? You know, one of the things that God hates, I'm going to tell you two because one's that important. I'll give you that one first. It says God hates hands that shed innocent blood. Think about abortion when I say that. God hates hands that shed innocent blood. But the other thing the Bible says that God hates is murmurers. Murmurers. People with an ungrateful spirit. People who don't appreciate the breaks that they're given in life. I'm sorry. Am I stepping up toes here? Okay. <laughs> It's got to be said. It's got to be said. Because we're told that, that, that we're to come to God with thanksgiving. And that's a heart of thanksgiving. Not just what's on your lips, but what's in your heart. It's the way you live. It's what, how you walk. And it goes on to say, beware. Now this is good. We know, you want to hear this. It says, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. There are a lot of religions, or a lot of self-help programs, or a lot of well-meaning people who will give you philosophy and tell you that's the answer. But first you need to understand what philosophy is and why the Apostle Paul here is talking against it. Philosophy. Let me give you a different, a different way of reading that from the Phillips translation uh, and the Taylor translation there. I've combined, combined them here, but this is what it says. Be careful that nobody spoils your faith through intellectualism 
or high sounding nonsense built on men's thoughts and ideas instead of what Christ has said. That makes more sense, doesn't it? The word philosophy, I have a definition here. Philos, Greek word philos, means fun of. It's where we get the word Philadelphia. The philio is like brotherly love. Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. But this definition says philos means fun of and sophos means wise things. Fond of wise things. But that's the wisdom of the world. Yeah. Not the wisdom of God. You see, you can hear some high sounding things taught that are absolutely deceiving and you don't even know you're being deceived. And then in the time of Paul, they had what they called sophists in the world. Where we get our word for sophistication. We think sophistication is good, right? You put on a tuxedo and a top hat, you can strut your stuff, right? But no, that's not exactly right. The definition of a sophist is one skillful and devious argumentation known for overly subtle, misleading arguments. Isn't that interesting? It's amazing, isn't it? Now, let's read a little further out of our lesson. Don't be deceived by this kind of teaching. Only on the word of Christ are you going to be able to rely. Only on the word that comes out of here are you going to be able to trust. I don't care how high sounding it sounds, how much sense it makes to you, how much wisdom the guy seems to have that's sharing it with you. It's man's wisdom. And it means nothing to God. This is the only way to salvation. And I'm giving it to you today. For in Him, we're talking about Jesus here, verse 9. In Him dwelleth all the fullness, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, all the fullness of the Godhead bodily in Jesus Christ. Thank you. Isn't that amazing? And you are complete. In Him. If you're complete in Him, what more do you need? You know, we were talking, uh, uh, Pastor Annette and Pastor Cliff were talking about stomping on the devil's head and getting him under your feet and taking authority over him and using the full armor of God and going on the attack after him and not running from him. And you're thinking, how in the world does that make any sense? Well, here's the answer, my friends. Jesus kicked his tail. Yes. Yeah. Hallelujah. Stripped him of his power. Thank you, Jesus. And gave it to you, the church. Yes, Lord. I'm going to prove it to you from the scriptures. But I want you to see it up front so you know where we're headed for with this. Read a little farther now. Verse 11. Now we go back to verse 10. And you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Who is the head of all principality and power? Jesus, Jesus Christ. He is the head of it. He wasn't always. There was a time when the devil had taken the dominion that had been given to Adam. Well, why didn't God just come back and take it back from the devil in the first place? Because once something is given, it doesn't belong to the one that gave it. It belongs to the one who received it. Adam had received authority in the earth. He could give it away if he wanted to, and he did. Dumb mistake, but he did. God had no right, legal right, to come back and take it. Until Jesus. Because it was in Jesus when Jesus said, Satan is trying to take me down. He's my worthy Lord. But he said he has nothing in me. He has nothing in me. In other words, he doesn't have authority over me. He doesn't rule over me. He doesn't have any right to take my life, but he's going to take it anyhow. Therefore, he is going to violate his right to the dominion in the earth. And that's how Jesus got it back. It cost him his life. But three days later, he was raised back from the dead because he had conquered Satan in his own turf. 
and legally took back what had been taken from the, from the church and from the body of Christ. He got it back for us in the garden. We'll, I'll prove it to you. We'll just keep going a little farther here. In whom ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. What is, what is all this circumcision stuff about? Circumcision in the Old Covenant was an agreement, a covenant relationship that God made with a certain race of people that we know as Israel. Yes. Through their father, the founder of the nation, through whom the, the son, the promised son came, Isaac, who became the father of this nation, of Israel. The sign of the covenant that God made was the shedding of human blood through circumcision. Every man was to be circumcised as a sign of that covenant, that they walked in covenant with God. They were a covenant people, and it was through that covenant people that Jesus Christ himself was born to fulfill the purpose of bringing that covenant to a close and opening the way for an eternal covenant that we know as the new covenant or the new testament that was sealed not in the blood of circumcision, but in the blood of the Lamb of God, the Son of God who offered himself up as a sacrifice. One time for all sin. And so this circumcision that we have is not a circumcision of our flesh. The blood has already been shed by, shed by Christ. Our circumcision is a circumcision of our heart. The old nature, the old desires, the old control of sin that, had, that sin had over us is cut off by the blood of Christ. And we are brand new creatures with his DNA. Now, we still haven't gotten to the, the, the exciting part of this. Let's keep going a little farther here. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. What handwriting? Well, let me start with this. There was this thing that, that the Old Covenant had called the law. You think of it as the Ten Commandments, but it went much deeper than that. It included every feast day, every high day, every sacrifice, every type of offering that was to be made, how it was to be made, where it was to be made, when it was to be made, all of these rules and laws and regulations, all of these things that no man could keep up with, even when they wanted to. That's right. And everything that they did that was contrary to God's will was written down against them, in a sense, that's the handwriting that's being talked about. First of all, the law itself. And then the disobedience to the law. All of these things was there that they had to face come judgment day. But here comes Jesus now. Remember, not all those people in the old covenant who broke that covenant went to hell. I want you to know that. Because they had a Savior too. He just hadn't been born yet. And they could look forward to it. But in the natural condition is what we're talking about. All of these things were written against mankind. He had no control over it. But here comes Jesus. And you be dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh as he quickened or made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Grace and mercy. Grace and mercy. Now, listen to this. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinance that was against us, which was contrary to us, he took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and, verse 15, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in. I'm going to give you another version of that, verse 15. 
from the Phillips Bible. 